Mr. Chaz Watkins? Damn it, I thought, but I didn't flinch and didn't miss a single line in my conversation with the bartender Kevin. I returned to Texas only six months ago, after three years of exile. How did she find me? And more importantly, why? I didn't turn around and didn't pay any attention to him. I was just about to deliver the punchline of a particularly dirty joke when I felt a hand on my shoulder. Mr. Watkins, my name is Rob Morgan. I was hired to find you. I raised an eyebrow at Kevin and turned my head slightly. Do you want to keep this hand, Robbie? I felt his hand leave my shoulder and turned to Kevin and said my line. He laughed heartily, poured me another shiner bock and said it was in the house, and he walked to the other end of the bar, still giggling. Mr. Watkins, we have business with you. I interrupted him. My name is not Watkins, and I have nothing to do with you unless you want to hire me to cook something. If not, then we have nothing to discuss. Mr. Watt was all he had time to say before he fell to the floor. I put twenty bucks on the counter, massaged my right hand, waved to Kevin, and got up to leave. Mr. Watkins, you are difficult to find, and I do not intend to start the search again. I looked down at the taser he was pointing at me, and even though he was sprawled out on the floor, it was pretty scary. When he stood up, he wiped a trickle of blood from the corner of his mouth. I have no doubts about the use of this device. So take a seat, and let's chat. I looked at Kevin, who was heading our way, and waved to him. He paused, nodded, and then said, Let me know if you need anything, Bill. Thank you, Kevin. I will do so. I turned around and looked at the asshole with the stun gun. Who carries a stun gun in Texas? I grinned and leaned a little closer to him. Do I know you, guy? Your manners need work, son. You couldn't have been raised in Texas. Why don't you call me Bill and then tell me who you are and what you need? Bill. Yes? Okay. Bill. Kevin. Organize a couple of beers for us and put it on Robbie's account. I smiled, sat down in the nearest booth and asked, so why don't you tell me who this Watkins guy is and why he's such a big stick in your ass? Okay, Bill, we'll play it your way. At least for now. Mr. Chaz Watkins was a successful, wealthy Dallas businessman who disappeared without a trace just over three years ago. He is married to Mrs. Amy Watkins, and they have one daughter, Sarah, aged 23 years. My name is, as I said, Rob Morgan. I was hired to find Chaz Watkins and bring him back to Dallas. Is it true? Three years, you say, and without a trace? What does this have to do with me? It looks like you mistook me for him, but I'm not Chaz Watkins or a successful businessman. My name is Bill Grant. I weld metal for money, play a little guitar, poorly, and travel a little. I was so careful. Before I left, I paid a ton of money for a completely new identity. Since then... I've grown my hair and beard, lost about 30 pounds of fat, and added about 20 pounds of muscle. Amy wouldn't recognize me even if I spat on her. When I left Dallas, I drove north and west for three days, stopped, found a trailer to rent, signed up for a welding class at a local community college, and started my life again. I left everything in Dallas except my money, a high-paying job, two houses, cars, credit cards, keys, cell phone, clothes, and a lying, cheating wife. I paid cash for a used Ford F-150, registered it under my new name, and drove it to the music store where I bought a used but beautiful Martin Dreadnought guitar. I took nothing with me except my clothes. I rarely stayed in one place for more than six to eight months and always paid in cash. I had no credit cards or cell phone. I worked for cash, under the table, didn't file a tax return, and almost always stayed out of trouble. It must have been Sarah. I couldn't cross it out completely. About 15 or 16 months after I left, I sent her a letter to let her know I was alive. I sent her another one, before every move, from my computer at the public library, just to let her know that I loved her and was thinking about her. I never told her where I was or why I left, and I did not answer her questions on either topic. She could get that out of her mother. Well, Bill, Robbie grinned. As I said, a little over three years ago, Mr. Watkins just up and disappeared and no one seemed to know anything about it. 
For the first year or so, the police followed it up, in my opinion, rather casually, and many suspected that he had either run off with another woman or that he was the subject of foul play on the part of Mrs. Watkins. It has been a difficult year for Mrs. Watkins, personally, professionally, financially. She tried to liquidate some of their assets, but she didn't have power of attorney and couldn't get Mr. Watkins declared dead, so she was stuck. There was money in the bank, but little new money was coming in, so she spent it pretty quickly. She hired a lawyer who helped her declare her husband dead. Unfortunately for Mrs. Watkins, about 16 months after her husband's disappearance, their daughter Sarah received an email from a man claiming to be Mr. Watkins. The daughter, of course, was happy, but declaring Mr. Watkins dead was not an easy matter. At this point, the police closed the case, and Mrs. Watkins hired my firm to find Mr. Chas Watkins and bring him to Dallas to face fraud charges so that Mrs. Watkins could have sole access and control of the family assets. Poor thing, I chuckled. Looks like she's in some trouble. So tell me, Robbie, how do I fit into this little made-for-TV movie? Well, Mr. Watkins, can I call you Chaz? You can call me Bill like everyone else. I am authorized by the state of Texas, if necessary, to compel you, Chaz Watkins, to appear before the Dallas County Sheriff to answer charges of fraud and child abandonment. I laughed out loud to his annoyance. That's too strong a word for a little guy, Robbie. Your story is sweet, but what kind of fraud was committed? When did abandoning a marriage become a crime in Texas, and why does the Dallas County Sheriff care? I'd say if you ever find this Chaz Watkins, you'll have to do a better job of intimidating him. He doesn't seem stupid to me. I think it's very difficult to convince him that he should come back to Dallas, and I suspect that if he just left, he had a good reason. Let me help you with a little role play, Robbie. Why should he come back? What will happen to him for this? I think you'll have to dig pretty deep to find the answer to these questions. I emptied my bottle of beer and took a sip. You can put away your little laser pointer now, Robbie. Under the table, I pulled the bolt of my Glock. He really should pay more attention to people. He lost his color a little, knowing there was a round in the chamber of the 9mm pistol pointed at him and carefully brought the stun gun to the spot on the table I was pointing at. I would like to tell you a story, Robbie. A friend of mine told me this story about three years ago, I would say. Are you listening? Fine. How about another couple of beers and a basket of wings, Kevin? My friend Robbie is paying here. There was this guy I met about three years ago, let's call him Chaz. He was married to a woman, let's call her Amy, and coincidentally, they had a daughter named Sarah. This is the story my friend Chaz told me. I can tell you when my marriage ended, or at least at the moment when I realized that he was doomed. It was Amy's 50th birthday. We decided to celebrate her 50th birthday at our country house over the weekend, just the two of us. She had always been a quiet woman who was not interested in parties or elaborate events. We are fairly well off, and so she had everything she needed and wanted. This made gift-giving difficult, but I spent months thinking about what to give her, felt her in conversations, polled her friends, and was happy with the gifts I chose for her. She obviously doesn't. This became clear as soon as she saw them. Her face dropped, just for a moment before a mask of forced gratitude appeared as she thanked me. By that time, we had been married for 24 years, and I thought I knew her well, but it was obvious to me that she expected something completely different. I pondered this thought for a while and then asked her how she really felt. She assured me that she was happy, but her smile was forced. I pressed the matter, and she finally admitted that the gifts weren't what she expected, and she was hoping for something more. Well, she wasn't sure what, just not this. If she didn't know, then how the hell could I know? I apologized for ruining such an important event for her and said that I would do my best to make amends. She told me that I could make amends if I wanted, but she was very surprised that her 50th birthday was not celebrated with more consideration on my part. Yes, I tried to explain to her the reason for each gift, but the more I talked, the more irritated she became. In the end, I promised to make amends, to which she replied, If you had thought of me first, you wouldn't have to try to make amends, and how can you make amends for such a mistake? 
I will never turn 50 again. Then she told me she wasn't feeling well and wanted to go home to Dallas. We drove home in silence, both seething with anger. We were almost never married. We were in a long-distance relationship while I was in college. She is three years older than me and has already graduated. And when I visited her for a long weekend, I caught Amy cheating. We were walking through the city center when we were stopped by a tall, elderly man, about 50 years old, who hugged her affectionately. Amy introduced the two of us, and when he shook my hand, he grinned. He grinned. He had a weak handshake, and my father taught me to always be careful around people who have a weak handshake. My vigilance was at its best, and I immediately stopped liking him. Nice to meet you, Dan. Are you a friend of Amy's father? I couldn't figure out what it was, but something wasn't right. Amy was a little excited, and he was acting a little smug. While she was at work that day, I did some digging and found out that they had been dating for about a month. I found their love letters, damn it. She didn't even hide it. We agreed to be exclusive. When I asked her about this, she, of course, denied everything. They were only friends. I told her to fuck off and immediately left. I didn't call or write to her. I didn't answer her calls. I threw her letters in the trash without reading them. Her friends started calling and I ignored them. Then she made my friends call me and beg for reconciliation. I asked them all to tell her not to worry that she can now freely have sex and marry her grandfather. I fucking hate it when people lie to me. Eventually, she came to me and over time, she was able to convince me to give her a second chance. I gave in but kept her on a short leash for a very long time and told her in no uncertain terms that if she cheated on me one more time, then it was all over between us. Two years later, we got married. She never admitted to cheating. After 11 years of marriage, Amy threatened to divorce me. I drank too much, worked too much, traveled too much, and she no longer wanted to share her life with me. We had a fight. I told her that while I couldn't limit my travel, I could cut back on work a little and, of course, limit my drinking. I begged her to think about our little daughter, Sarah. She eventually agreed, but I was saddled with some pretty tight restrictions and she began to separate our finances and lives. She told me she was just preparing for the inevitable. I pointed out to her that she didn't really seem to want it, and she just shrugged and left the room. However, I was determined, and over the next few years, she relaxed. Mainly, I think, because I began to earn several times more than she did. In fact, I paid more taxes than she earned in a year, and separate finances only benefited me allowing me to pursue my own interests without having to discuss something with her. I bought a couple of motorcycles, a large sailboat, took flying lessons, and bought a Cessna airplane. I wore designer suits and drove a late-model BMW. I bought our second home in the countryside, a secluded place on 50 acres, without any financial help from her. I was always the first contributor to the household, paid for all the family vacations, and yet I lived a life that she wanted a bigger piece of. So she relaxed. I'm not sure we ever truly recovered from this episode. Two years ago, I was close to divorcing her. Over the years, Amy became more aggressive towards me. She became obstinate, and I became her subordinate. We rarely had sex, maybe twice a year, and when we did, it was more like we were both scratching an itch. There was no intimacy, no love. I was sure she had been cheating on me for years, but I had no proof. I don't think she had any long-term affairs, just a lot of one-night stands while she was traveling for work. She became better at cheating and hiding it. Our daughter had just left for college, and one evening, after a rather unpleasant and public attack on my character and attractiveness, I had had enough and gave her an ultimatum. Either we work on becoming a stronger, more loving couple with a better communication and an active, full-fledged sex life, or we go different ways. I no longer wanted to live as people who simply tolerated each other's presence. I had to file for divorce from her before she agreed to talk. We argued for days, and it was the first time in years that we actually communicated. She didn't want a divorce. This surprised me, and I told her about it. She promised that she would return to our relationship and work on her part of the marriage. I was skeptical, feeling that she actually wanted my money, but I loved her and eventually gave in. So we agreed on new rules of engagement and communication and set about fixing our marriage. I took the lead and pushed her, and although she seemed content to travel down this road with me, 
I always felt as if I was chauffeuring Miss Daisy's car. She was in the back seat admiring the scenery while I did everything. Hard work. After a year, I told her that I wanted her to sit in the front seat with me and drive the car sometimes. She agreed, but stubbornly continued to sit in the back seat. Of course, she had her list of complaints, and I listened to them, acknowledged them, and began trying to resolve each of them. I loved her. And although she rarely initiated anything to improve our marriage, she participated in everything I suggested, and the situation improved. We began to communicate better and have much more rewarding and frequent sex, maybe twice a week, sometimes more. She wasn't as sexually adventurous as she was at the beginning of our marriage, but she was willing to try new things and seemed content. I relaxed, we were happy, but I also knew she was holding back. A few weeks passed after her 50th birthday, and it seemed that things were becoming increasingly frosty between us. The affection weakened, at least on her part, and the sex gradually dried up. When I asked Amy about it, she blamed it on work stress and promised that when her schedule calmed down, everything would go back to normal. But that did not happen. She always had to work long hours in the middle of projects, so at first I didn't see anything alarming about late nights. But then it started to dawn on me that this seemed more extreme than usual and that I was spending more weekends alone at our country house. However, she always had a plausible excuse, so I decided to just wait a little longer. Over the next six weeks, we only had sex twice, both times at my insistence, and both times she seemed to just tolerate it while I came. Immediately after one lovemaking session, in which she barely participated, she turned over on her back, and another time, she simply left the room. In the evenings and on weekends, she did everything she could to avoid me. When this was impossible or difficult, she seemed bored at best, but more often just irritated. I remember this picture. The shrew has returned. Part of our job over the previous two years was to discuss any issues that came up before they escalated into fights. And if we did fight, to try to be better, more productive in our conflicts. Remaining as impersonal as possible, we persisted in pursuing a solution, always trying to see the other side. We did not tolerate excuses, excuses or non-participation. We have always acknowledged the feelings of the injured party and tried to resolve only these issues. No evasions, avoidances or accusations. When I told her about her schedule, lack of affection, and our dead sex life. She didn't want to discuss it. Over the course of several days, she put the conversation off several times, and when I pointed out that she was not playing by our new rules of interaction and communication, she told me to shove the rules up my ass and leave her alone. I suppressed my anger and, between clenched teeth, reminded her that we had agreed that these rules were important and not negotiable, she told me to fuck off and continue to negotiate with my right hand. Message received, loud and clear. Did she cheat on me? Maybe. I didn't need to know. Texas is a no-fault state, but I wanted to know. It was clear that our marriage was over, and if that was the case, her cheating didn't change much. But I hate being lied to, and this time, she would pay for it. I often reminded her that I thought about loyalty and honesty. I understand that you can't choose who you're attracted to, but you can choose what to do about it. I told her that if she was so attracted to someone else that she couldn't help herself, we would get a divorce first. It will hurt me, but I will respect her for respecting me enough to wait until we get divorced and be honest with me. We could have parted amicably, sort of, and I promised to do the same for her. I needed to know for sure, and I needed to do something. Before we combined our finances, about eight years prior, I moved some of my money into an investment account. I have also made arrangements with my employer to have all my bonuses deposited into this new account. I never told my wife about this, mainly because she wanted control of our finances and I thought I could invest better than her. It turned out that I was right, and my investment portfolio became very healthy. One of the benefits offered by my long-term employer was tax return preparation and filing, and this was the one area where my wife and I never saw eye to eye. 
At her insistence, we started filing our taxes separately 13 years ago, and she didn't see any real benefit in changing that, so we didn't. I suspected that she was hiding money and decided that this would allow me to hide this investment account from her. I planned to surprise her with money in retirement if we made it that far. The way I see it, if she hadn't cheated and we got divorced, I would have happily divided all of our assets, but if she had cheated, well, that was a different matter. I had to figure out how to protect this money. She will not be rewarded for her betrayal and dishonesty. I also had to figure out how to gain control of our joint accounts, sell our house in Dallas. It was in my name only, but she loved it, and try to keep our vacation property. I loved the place. We planned to retire there, and I didn't want to give it to her or sell it. Of course, if it looked like I couldn't keep it for myself, I would make her sell it before I let her take it. I paid for it, furnished it, and maintained it for ten years. As far as I understand, she simply had no right to it. If I had to, I would give her the house in Dallas. I wanted to get rid of him just because she loved him so much, but I would give up that pleasure if it meant I could keep my country house. This would take time, and I wasn't sure she wasn't just going to serve me soon, so I immediately got to work. The first thing I needed to do was contact a lawyer. One of my old college buddies was a corporate lawyer here in Dallas. I called him and asked him to meet with me, and he readily agreed. We met at a road cafe near his office that evening, and over dinner and a couple of beers, I explained my situation and asked for a referral to a family law attorney, as well as his personal and legal views on my situation. His legal advice was sobering. Basically, I was completely screwed. If I divorced her, there would be no way to protect my property from her. In any case, no legal means. And while there was still a healthy network of good guys in Texas that didn't condone cheating wives, no guilt meant I could get a 50-50 split with a little alimony for Amy. It doesn't matter who did what. If she cheated on me, then no harm, nothing bad. Give her half of everything you have and let her move her boyfriend into your house while you pay her child support. He advised me from a legal standpoint if it affects the status of my marriage to do nothing. I just blinked at him. He smiled and said, don't divorce her, change the equation. Find out if she's cheating, and if so, then strip what you can take with you. Let her file for divorce and try to get back everything you take with her. He referred me to a shark lawyer who specialized in family law. She was the only lawyer he feared if he and his wife were getting a divorce. This was plan B. She kept avoiding me, and I let her. I no longer asked about her schedule, her weekends, our sex life, or our lack of intimacy, and she seemed to take that as a victory. It's like I just accepted the new situation. Now I spent most of my time in our country house and rarely saw her. This seemed to please her. My new divorce lawyer met with me and helped me change the beneficiaries in my will, insurance policies, etc. She also suggested that I hire a private investigator because, as she said, Texas may be innocent, but there's nothing like a little visual carnal evidence to push negotiations in the right direction. I agreed. She recommended a former police officer who ran an agency that she had used for some time with great success and asked her assistant to contact him to set up a meeting. He saw me the same day. I paid for the Daylux package, and our entire life was equipped with audio and video. Within a few days, they had learned the who, when, and how long, and were working to obtain video evidence that my lawyer thought could help me if it came to a divorce. A week later, I sat and watched the video evidence. It was more devastating than I thought, and even Plan B disappeared from my thoughts. Sex didn't seem like a big deal to me. He wasn't any more gifted than me, or in better shape. He didn't have the best techniques or even excite her, for the most part. She didn't do anything to him that she hadn't done to me, but her date took every opportunity to verbally put me down, and she participated enthusiastically, even suggesting they have sex in my bed next time, which they did. I didn't know this woman, and wondered if I had ever really known her, feeling empty. Knowing that your spouse is cheating and seeing him cheat are two completely different things. I have no strength left to fight. I sealed the videotape and gave it to my lawyer for safekeeping.
with instructions to give it to my daughter in the event of my death. I prepaid Sarah's college tuition until graduation from our joint savings account and then liquidated my investment account. I myself lived on what I had from my investment account, and it would have lasted me for years without being frugal. And now, our joint savings account was seriously depleted. Two weeks later, I looked around the house one last time, sighed, and came to terms with my decision. I left my keys, cell phone, and wallet on the table in the foyer where I always left them. I took off my wedding ring and threw it on the pillow that was on my side of the bed. Let her think about it. Then I left. I didn't talk to anyone, didn't leave letters. I walked out the front door without even bothering to close it, walked around the corner, got into my new pickup truck, and drove away. Two weeks later, a 40-year-old married man and father of three was robbed and severely beaten while leaving a motel. He was able to walk again, but only after some time, and then with a pronounced limp. A month after the robbery, his wife received a FedEx package containing a video of her husband having sex with a woman who appeared to be in her 50s. As I understand it, they divorced a year later, and he was broke. After I left, I drove aimlessly for three days. I didn't have any plans. Finally, one day I stopped in a small town for lunch and decided to stay for a while. I found a small community college that offered welding courses and enrolled. Why not? After 12 months, I managed to find a job as a welder at an auto repair shop. I only had a year of training, so I couldn't get a real welding job. But I found a lot of people willing to hire the guy for cash, since it was a lot cheaper than a certified welder. And most welders were not interested in the small jobs I took. I enjoyed my job there for another four months before I decided it was time to move on. For the next two years, I traveled around the country, occasionally stopping in small towns. For the first time in many years, I enjoyed life. I hated my job in Dallas. The money was fantastic, but although I was a natural and good at it, I found it difficult to get up every morning to spend another day doing it. I did this for my family. Amy expected it and Sarah deserved it. Amy liked money, which meant she could play saint by working for a non-profit organization that was paid pennies to help other people. In fact, the organization she worked for consisted mostly of the wives of wealthy businessmen who wanted something to do and be seen doing. All of their fundraising events were featured in the local Who's Who newspaper, and the dresses the employees wore cost more than most of their clients earned in a year of hard work. It was pathetic, and most of the money raised went to fund the next charity event. Basically, they helped themselves feel better. Meanwhile, I was working my ass off at a job I hated because I loved my family, and that was what was expected of me. When I left, I decided that from now on, I would do everything only for myself. During these three years, I had sex with several women. I enjoyed it and sincerely hoped that they did too, but I was doing it for myself. I had no intention of settling down, and if they became too intrusive or difficult, I simply turned them off. I wanted to get laid, not find a freen or soul mate. Since then, I haven't looked back and don't plan to. I don't know what happened to Amy, the house, or the 50 acres of land in the village, and I don't care. She has chosen her path in life, and if she is happy with her decision, then I can live with that. I secretly hope she's miserable and penniless, but I won't go out of my way to make that happen. I'd like to see my daughter again someday, but only if she promises not to tell Amy. So far, it is difficult for her to make such a promise. I keep hoping. As far as I understand, Robbie, my friend, is happy now. He left his cheating wife and miserable job and doesn't think about his old life. Why should he come back? To pay her to make him miserable and let her make him miserable again? It just doesn't make sense to him. He is happy, healthy, and rich in all the areas that matter. His wife and his marriage to her made him unhappy. When he finally woke up and gave in, he realized that the only two good things that came out of it were his daughter and, ultimately, his freedom. He finally realized that, in fact, he was the only one in this marriage. You know, he told me that after he left and tried several other women, he realized that even in bed, she wasn't that good. Looking back, he realized that she had never, not once, brought her A-game to the marriage. 
She played with him for 24 fucking years. This doesn't seem like something worth staying or coming back for. Hey, Kev, how about a couple more beers? He told me that he felt his wife was a narcissistic narcissist, and so he decided that the cruelest thing he could do to her was to ignore her. He didn't want her to see his pain so she could feed off of it and feel like she mattered because of it. Indifference was the key. It would have killed her. But how could he be around her and be indifferent? He decided that if he just left everything, he would thereby tell her that he was indifferent not only to her, but to their entire life together. He decided that it might take years, but eventually she would stumble and fail, and he would win. Robbie sighed and nodded. You're an interesting person, Bill, and it's a good story. Where is your friend now? I shrugged. God knows, Robbie. He's having fun somewhere or cooking something. Definitely not working hard for an ungrateful, cheating wife. I think he's probably in Wisconsin. He told me he always wanted to see Wisconsin. Wherever he is, I'm sure he's happy and doesn't want to change anything. Tell me, why doesn't your friend Mrs. Watkins just file for divorce on the grounds of child abandonment? Wouldn't this give her the control over the marital assets that she so badly wants? I think this is a simple solution to her problem, and then you can stop looking for this Chaz and pissing off complete strangers in the process. There are no more assets to take control of, Bill. She tried to file to leave the family, but because she tried to have him declared dead first, by the time she got around to filing, she had lost her home, her vacation property, and her job. What are you saying? What happened and why are you still looking for this guy? Well, she ran out of money, couldn't afford the property on her salary, and since she couldn't sell it, both properties were repossessed. The house was bought by an elderly retired couple, and the country estate was bought by a company called CWW LLC, which is some kind of metal art consulting company. Mrs. Watkins lost her job when it was discovered she was having an affair with a married employee. Wow, that's not what she wanted, is it, Robbie? He nodded. Well, I'm certainly sorry I wasted your time, Bill, but I almost enjoyed meeting you. He took 40 bucks out of his wallet, threw them on the table, stood up and extended his hand to me. No hard feelings. None, I said, but in the future you should be careful with those you upset. You're lucky I'm such a patient guy. He laughed as he turned to leave. He took about six steps before stopping and, without turning around, asked, Bill? Yes? For that matter, Amy still loves him. She is sorry and hopes to get him back. She's depressed, drinks too much, and can't cope. Women like her don't know what love is, Robbie. They love themselves, and they love what other people give them. They are consumers and are unable to think about others. They are greedy and vile and deserve whatever suffering they bring upon themselves through their mistreatment of others. If she was sorry, she wouldn't continue to have sex with other men. Her only regret is that she is not provided with the opportunity for people to find out the truth about her. She regrets that she was caught and that the money dried up. If she was truly sorry, she might think about her daughter's feelings and how she is suffering without a relationship with her father. She could have thought about what she put her husband through and left him alone. She doesn't deserve him, but she won't admit it. In her twisted, sick little world, she is the center of the universe, and reality, responsibility, love, respect, and honesty only work when they align with her goals. He and his daughter deserve better, don't you think? He slowly turned to face me. Shay? Yes, Bob? Wisconsin can be cold in the winter, but I know Sarah likes it there. Maybe CWW LLC should move its office to Racine? Thank you, Bob. Maybe. Everything is possible. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one. 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 Listening to the next one.